Welcome everyone to Asian Pacific Voices Radio, where you'll find stimulating conversations that explore diverse topics and stories impacting our Asian Pacific American communities. I'm your host, Arnold Chun. Today, I have the honor to welcome an extraordinary advocate and catalyst for change with a profoundly personal narrative as a transracial adoptee from South Korea. She infuses her work with unparalleled insight and unwavering passion. As the founder and president of the Mixed Roots Foundation, she has committed herself to advocating diversity, advancing diversity, fostering inclusion, and providing vital support for the adoption and foster care community. It is my pleasure to welcome Holly Chunyang Bachman on Asian Pacific Voices Radio. Welcome, Holly. Hi, thank you, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Arnold. This is a special treat because I've known you for quite some time. And I think, uh, you know, the work that you're doing is just absolutely outstanding. Uh, the things that you're doing for the adoptee community, specifically from Korea, uh, just bravo, bravo. And thank you so much. Just wanted to start um, by maybe you sharing a pivotal moment in your childhood as an adolescent that shaped your understanding of identity and belonging, particularly as a transracial adoptee, if you might sharing with us. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I pretty much have known kind of my calling since like sixth grade, and it's always been like bringing people together and um, and whatever capacity. And but it was really when it was in high school uh, in 1995 when my mom approached me uh, and she was like, Holly, there's this opportunity to write an essay and it, and it would be a trip to Korea. I'm like, what? You know, and uh, and so I I uh, helped uh, my mom help write the essay and at least help me articulate. And and what the uh, essay was all about is what would a trip to Korea mean in my life? And it's a one page, um, uh, like 500 word essay. And uh, that was like probably end of September, early October. And at the end of October, I actually got the call and saying that my essay got selected. And there was over 1,200 applicants, 45 got reviewed, and 15 Korean adoptees got to go. And uh, it was a trip of a lifetime. And I could I can remember it like just as, like yesterday. And and how pivotal that was with you know my journey of discovering my roots. Um, I've always grown up as feeling like you know I'm I'm white and you know I have my heritage as Korean, but uh, but just you know not really being in touch of my Korean roots. Um, I mean I love my parents. They always you know they. Uh, took me to Korean culture camps, but even during that time, I didn't really, I, I always wanted just to fit in. And so when I had this opportunity to go back to Korea motherland tour in 1995, I was like, okay, this, this would be really interesting. And I actually discovered that I was actually the only one that had never been to Korea out of amongst the 14 other Korean adoptees. So um, it was truly a, a trip of a lifetime. The desire to fit in, what a powerful um, motivation that is, right? That's something just so human to all of us. We all want to fit in, whether it's in the high school setting with our cliques, our friends, our family, our social groups, our workplaces, our communities, our neighborhoods. Uh, it's such a powerful drive. And just, I'm so encouraged to hear how you took that and decided to, you know, discover and explore uh, that side of your life. It's just an amazing, an amazing journey. So I really appreciate you sharing that. We want to know about your foundation. Um, clearly, that's obviously been the passion uh, since, you know, you started that 13 years ago. Can you share with us just uh, what was the personal journey like? like what, what influenced the mission and the vision of the Mixed Roots Foundation? And how do you see it evolving at this point forward? Yeah, thank you, Arnold. I mean, I think uh, with uh, how Mixed Roots Foundation actually got started uh, with the name Mixed Roots uh, is actually literally right when I got back from my uh, the, my trip to Korea in 1995 that I started a high school cultural diversity group called Mixed Roots. And when you talk about identity and belonging, um, that was really the space for students to come together and feel like they belong. So we did culture events. Um, you know, we did plays, um, we had breakfast with the principal every week, um, and to talk about those hard issues of, of racism, discrimination, but also the, the sense of culture and belonging and diversity. And so since then, I mean, this is like almost 30 years ago, um, just really quickly with the pandemic, um, I actually found out uh, during that time that the high school culture diversity group still exists today. And so um, with with all of that time and space, um, I had actually moved from uh, 
uh, Minnesota to California and in San Francisco in 2011, um, I had gotten involved with the Korean adoptee group. Um, and so uh, when I decided kind of to move on from there, I, I was like, well, let me do something with mixed roots. And so essentially in 2011, May um, is when Mixed Roots Foundation was born. And at that time, the roots of mixed roots has always been about multiculturalism, but then the whole cause of adoption and foster care uh, came into play. And um, it's been an amazing journey. And I mean, you touched on a very, very important part, our, our high school years, right? I mean, I remember I wanted to check out the Asian club, the you know Korean club, the Japanese club, the <laughs> Spanish club, all the various clubs that we as individuals gravitate to. And I think when I'm just, list, just listening to you talk about that, I, I don't remember there being like, oh, if you're half, you know, white or half black or half Korean or half Asian and half Japanese or, or half Spanish or whatever it is, I could understand how uh, difficult that be, could be for an adolescent, you know, and a kid at that time. And so um, that's just amazing that you, you know, provided that kind of space, that kind of environment at that such a, a pivotal time in, in your know, children's lives in the high school years. It's so um, it's so amazing that thank you for doing that um, well, just, in just terms quick. of your foundation. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say just quickly, too, though, it wasn't just, you know, say for biracial mix, but it was actually for international students that I mean, we had a very robust international program. And so we had tons of international students that came in and we basically became this welcome uh, group for those international students. So it was really literally from, uh, you know, students of color locally, um, African-American, Vietnamese, um, you know, uh, Hmong and uh, Somali, which was a huge growing community at that time. Um, and then at the international group, which we had people from Israel, Peru, Germany, Russia. And it was just so lovely because we all came together to learn about each other's cultures. So it, w it was amazing. No, you're absolutely right. Um, I, and I was just thinking back to my high school years, just um, there were, you know, in the Asian club, uh, individuals that were coming from a very biracial kind of background. And I do remember at times, you know, there's some moments they didn't feel quite connected. And, you know, also, yes, international students at the same time, language barrier. I mean, it's a it's a huge thing, right, that kind of also, um, you know, affects the way that people feel included and sort of the ability to connect with people. So I, I think that's great that you did something like that on a very wide, wide sort of spectrum. Um, in terms of the Mixed Roots Foundation, uh, I wanted to ask you, how do you envision it making a tangible impact on the adoption and foster care community locally here? Whether it's, I mean, obviously now you're in Los Angeles. I know you did uh, the bulk of the establishment of the work in Minnesota, but I guess now that you're here locally in Los Angeles, um, how would the impact happen for this community here and also globally, if you can uh, share about that? Well, I mean, through its journey, I mean, we're celebrating 13 years uh, this May. And so throughout that whole time period um, from Minnesota to you know, Minneapolis to San Francisco to now LA, uh, we also have done work in New York, but um, just really the impact is just, you know, we're a philanthropic organization. We're not a direct service, um, but we are all about raising awareness and then raising funds for to supporting the adoption and foster care community and their families. So a lot of the work that we've done is really to support the adoptee, the individual themselves. I always talk about how, you know, adoption is not about the process. Adoption is not about the process, but it's about the person. And uh, really what made our mark was uh, doing our signature sporting events. And that's that was our adoptee day, adoptee night events. Uh, San Francisco Giants was our inaugural team. Um, and it was really to just bring together the greater community. It was, it was, uh, it was really a way for to bring in the greater community of the adoption foster care together. Um, and also to educate people about, you know, when you adopt a child or even if you're adopted yourself, that um, you actually, if you, you know, we actually grow up and become adults, but also the fact that uh, we are, our journey is lifelong. So, you know, through, from DNA testing to mentoring to um, just sponsoring kids to a, a major league sports game, um, that's kind of the impact that we've been doing. And then also scholarships and grants. I imagine you must have had just a lot of challenges. I mean, between not only just having the, the organization established, but people who don't 
share the same passion, maybe, or even uh, bureaucracies or, you know, municipalities or whoever you're uh, trying to align yourself with to help in the advocacy that you're working on. I'm sure there's been just quite a bit of um, challenges. I'd love for you to share with us, like, what were some of the biggest things that you had to overcome? And also, how maybe did you navigate those people to then change their perspective about what you're doing? I appreciate that question because I think a lot of people, when people think about adoption or foster care, they always do think about the process of adoption. And and so that was one thing that we had to overcome is that we're not an agency. You know, we do support that children need families, but we really wanted to, and what I've overcome and, and my board and everyone that's been along this journey is to educate people that, the adopt, you know, when you think about the ad adoptee, that the most person that's impacted say about adoption is the individual themselves that got adopted, whether they have to navigate foster families, birth families, adoptive families, you know, even step families. So, so that was one thing that we had to overcome is to kind of re-educate the um, public and community that um, the adoptee themselves is the most important person in the adoption process. Um, I think also from a culture standpoint um, is uh, educating people about you know, the mixed race and being multicultural. Um, I think there's a lot of transracial adoptees that are in different multiracial families. Um, and I think, um, you know, the biggest thing is that, you know, mixed roots is not, you know, because I'm Korean, it's not just for Koreans, although that's how it's, you know, our roots are, you know, from there. Um, but mixed roots is the fact that we are multicultural and we're global and we come from everywhere and, and, and that everyone belongs. Um, I think another one too is that when we talk about adoption, there was a lot of um, interesting kind of raising the hand of adoptive parents saying, well, what about us? And well, I'm like, well, you've always been the main uh, kind of, uh, you know, voice out there um, for having you know, adopted this little beautiful little child or a little doll or a Chinese little doll or, you know, um, but, but th those are kind of the little, the, the kind of the racism issues that we've had to address too is that, you know, again, talking to adoptive parents, even if they're white or, you know, a, you know, adopting children of color that, you know, we have those identity and unique um, and also just being adopted with the biological and cultural roots. So, um, but that is, that's been kind of the challenges to just re-educate the public that, you know, uh, we as adoptees, um, have a lifelong journey and it's not just like a transaction of adopting a child. It's like, it's for the rest of our life. Mm. The, you're, you're right. I mean, you're so, uh, you're so right with what you're talking about, especially because I think for you, you represent that you, you come from having that experience personally. Um, I'm curious about the significance for yourself. I mean, you, obviously you discover you have two birthdays when you visit Korea. Um, was that an impact on you? I mean, how did you, uh, feel about that part? I mean, you know, going to Korea and visiting and you have two different birthdays, like, was that something that kind of you had to overcome as, of your sense of self and um, who you are as a person in that way? I, it did because, you know, I think, I mean, I've, I've you know, been involved and in having many friends with, um, you know, Korean adoptees or even adoptees from all over the world and, and having their different stories. Um, that it is common that, you know, we don't really know our real birthday. Um, but when I did go to my orphanage for the first time in 2010 and see actually pictures, I've never seen baby pictures, but to see actually documentation that my real birthday was August 15th and not August 10th, it was like, wow, you know. Um, so it took yeah. a little bit um, to, uh, you know, adjust. And it still is a little bit because I've lived with this August 10th birthday, but but yet now, but my real birthday, like actually I was August 15th. So, but I've kind of made it a, a, a joke and also a, not a joke, but, you know, to make fun and light of it to say, well, you know, I just celebrate, I celebrate the whole week or I, or celebrate the whole month, you know? And so I get double the gifts or, you know, double the parties or double, you know, um, and I've actually leveraged it to, you know, to be honest, you know, leverage it for some fundraising, you know, you know, you know, 15, 10 for 15, uh, you know, and all of that. So, um, but I've, you know, you have to be positive and, and really always make it, um, you know, a turnaround. But, but when I did first find about, about that, I was like, wow, okay. You know, and I feel like, am I real? You know, but I've adjusted. Mm. 
you kind of make me want to have two birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> In the sense of celebration, not because of, you know, your background, but like, oh, yeah, I'm, I, yeah, maybe yeah. that's a bad joke. I don't know. No, no. I, I hear <laughs> um, that a lot. <laughs> Yeah. So I know that you're the co-chair of uh, U of M's Multicultural Alumni Network. And I wanted to ask you about that particular part. Um, how do you integrate the mission of Mixed Roots Foundation into like broader discussions about diversity and inclusion with um, at, at being the co-chair of, of that part? So I'm the former co-chair because I did step down in two, uh, 20, 2021. But I, you know, um, I think what was interesting with that um, experience and um, having the ability to really kind of bring the diversity to uh, educational institution is I had kind of then went back to my roots with kind of the high school experience and to just, you know, at a, a, an alumni level. And, um, and you know, the alumni group is, is slowly, you know, multicultural alumni group is still growing slowly but surely. And I, I mean, the overall purpose and mission was, you know, there's all these uh, groups out there, just black, just Asian, just LGBT, and there's even just Greek. Um, and uh, and it's like, no, let's do the multicultural um, alumni network where we can bring all those different identities and all those different cultures together. Because it's, you know, there's a there's a tagline that we have for Mixed Roots Foundation. It's, it's all about identity, diversity, but most importantly, unity. And when you look at actually our logo, we talk about identity, which is the brown root. It's like, it's to know yourself. Um, and then for the diversity is that to not, not to know yourself, you have to know others. That's your diversity. And then the unity piece is, you know, is how you bring all that together. It's kind of your three steps of becoming your, your full self. And, and when you go through that process, like I went through that identity ish um, phase was, you know, finding my roots. I'm Korean, you know, not to be ashamed of it and feel actually proud. Um, but then the diverse is like you step, take a step outside of your own culture, uh, your own self, and you get to know other people. I always say to know is to experience. If you really know that person, you experience that person. So that was kind of the whole um, kind of platform, you know, reasoning for uh, the U of M's multicultural alumni is, and even with mixed roots, it's in general, is get people to know each other. And then those barriers of stereotypes and, you know, um, preconceived notions, um, assumptions um, die down. That's so true. Um, my gosh, that's really, really profound. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I would like to imagine that um, adoptees, there's a lot of, and foster youth, there's a, a number of different needs, whether they're mental, emotional, spiritual, physical. And I would like to know, how important are collaboration and partnerships for Mixed Roots Foundation to help achieve uh, those goals and helping adoptees and foster, foster youth with the needs that they have? Absolutely. Um, that is essentially, I always kind of kind of joke and, and, and say that with kind of, you know, Mixed Roots Foundation is like the chamber for adoption foster care. Um, and that is really how we operate is it, it is all about strategic partnerships. It's all about collaboration because I always believe you can't do it by yourself. And, and when you can align yourself with others that support your mission or maybe do a little bit different um, where you can kind of uh, support one another in different ways, um, everyone wins. And I've always been a true believer of making everything mutually beneficial where everyone um, can come together as a team. Um, and then in, 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 in respect for adoption foster youth, um, even with the triad, you know, there, there is like birth mother, uh, foster mother and the adoptive mother. And that's a whole nother collaboration right there if it's an open adoption. But then it's also the identity piece of knowing all three. Um, but you take it on a higher level. You, we have a strategic partnership with all the Department of Children and Family Services. And, and it's been amazing work with them because they can outreach to um, children and families that we can support. Um, and it's just been lovely. Um, our signature sporting teams you know, I, I was, I met with Michael Reagan, who's the adopted son of from former president Ronald Reagan. And when we first met, he was like, Holly, in order to make this successful, you have to reach the critical mass. And then at that time, it was like, baseball, sports. And that's essentially how our, our adoptee night, adoptee day events happen with the Major League Baseball. And that's to raise that awareness to say that you're not alone. There's, you know, we're all in this together. The voices of and experiences of the adoptees has got to be just very powerful to to hear and have them be represented. I'm wondering, 
um, because there's so much diversity there. What do you, what kind of strategies do you come up with? What do you guys um, put into place to make sure that those voices are heard, especially within the foundations, initiatives and programs? Are there things that you specifically do to allow uh, that to happen organically for a lot of adoptees? Well, thank you so much for asking, because actually there was a person that reached out uh, when we first started the foundation and they were like, um, are you starting an anti-adoption agency or organization and, or agency? I'm like, no, we're, we're not anti anything. And it, it's like for all for all the people. And, you know, um, and, and then that's the thing, you know, exactly to your point, Arnold, that there is a range of very happy adoptees and then very angry adoptees and ones that have been traumatized to ones that have had a beautiful life and they have great connections with family. And, but that's one thing that we want to try to educate is Mixed Roots Foundation embraces all of those experiences. So, you know, what we do is we reach out to different organizations, individuals, um, to a celebrity, to people that are right in a mentoring program that's trying to uh, foster a relationship with um, foster youth in the system. Um, so we really try to outreach to every person um, that wants to share and be a part of that community. Um, there are some that don't want to have anything to do with it, which is okay. Um, but, you know, we do want to be that platform where everyone does have a voice. Mm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you can't, uh, you, you can't rescue and save everyone. You yeah. know, you, you make the effort and you put the work in to try to uh, impact and affect and, um, you know, make a difference in, in those that, that do embrace it and can actually uh, become transformed, of course, for sure. So for the future ahead, we want to know some of the hopes, aspirations, uh, and, and is there a, a change in the way that adoption is um, happening in terms of the landscape of foster care? Like how does Mixed Roots Foundation aim to uh, uh, tackle if there are changes that are coming in that way? Or what, what are some of the hopes and aspirations that you see for the future going forward? Well, I think, you know, continue to serve as that philanthropic arm of the adoption foster care community. I mean, to, to continue to partner with organizations that align with our vision and mission, uh, individuals. Um, I think, uh, you know, our goal is, you know, when we first started, we were like guns blazing. We're going to like be that next, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for Adoption and Foster Care. Um, and I, I think what we've done so far, I, we've done a lot and impact um, with a very small but mighty board. Um, I mean, at, the, at a time we did have many board members, but we've decided that, you know what, um, less is more and, and also quality is better than quantity. And that's kind of every level of what we do. So really, and, you know, again, I, I just had a great meeting with Michael this today and he said, focus, focus. And I think, and I think that's been um, my personal journey is how do we focus on just a few things to really make that impact? And I think going forward, that's what our goal is, is to really focus on a few projects, but that will have really, um, you know, big impact and, you know, continue doing our scholarships, continue to do our signature sporting events, but to really identify, like you said, is where do we have the most impact? Um, and uh, multimedia has been always there. And so, uh, you know, we're going to be teaming up with you and Amy and your team with uh, your fi the film Children of War. And I think that's another platform for us that, you know, we've done a lot of PSAs for different um, uh, events that we've done. And so just to continue that uh, multimedia outreach to raise that awareness. You're doing just some incredible work, and I can imagine you're just spread thin. I mean, I, I don't know how much energy or where you find the energy to do what you do, but um, thank you just for the work that you're doing. It's just so um, profound and respectable and just um, inspiring. And I think you're serving a community that desperately needs uh, that kind of um, a kind of organization like yourself that you have to um, advocate for them. And so with that in mind, I mean, I'm sure there's just so much that you have going on in your foundation and, you know, the kind of work that energy that requires leading it and running it. What do you do to unwind? Like, tell, tell, tell us about like, like how you unwind hobbies, pleasures, things that you indulge in. We'd love to know, you know, just about you. It's a, apart from running the foundation. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, I love, I love uh, going to, you know, sporting events. I love going to, um, I'm a big football fan, grew up with watching that with my dad. And, um, but also I, I love watching movies, um, and, and just going out having, you know, maybe a, a light drink here and there. Um, but, you know, spending 
you know, time with friends and family. Um, I, I have a real um, joy of mentoring. So I have mentees in all these different cities I've lived in and I've stayed in touch with them. And um, so, and it's, it's fun to go out with them to hear what they're doing. Um, but that's kind of my wind down of just kind of disconnecting and, and, you know, being able to enjoy someone else versus being in the, you know, the, uh, the trenches of doing this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So last fun little question, if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be and why? And how might their experiences or perspective resonate with your work at Mixed Roots Foundation? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that. I mean, a historical figure. I mean, I, um, how, well, you know, I, I'm having a brain. <laughs> I, I was trying to think about <laughs> that. Okay. Yeah, um, I'd have to think about that. Sorry, guys. I'm, yeah. And okay. Okay. How about this one? Uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be, and how would you use it to further the mission of Mixed Roots Foundation? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think the superpower of not only having lots and lots of money to to just give 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 away, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think uh, the the superpower of travel. I think that the travel. I love travel, and then be able to um, you know travel from. If I could just loop around the world or even the country. And, and to be there all at once uh, and to make that impact in all these different um, you know, cities and countries because we're all over everywhere. Um, people don't realize that the, the, how many people, six in 10 people are connected by adoption in some way. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so when you think about that, and that's you know, globally and here in the United States. So um, that's, that would be my superpowers if I could just travel all at once to everywhere. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. Once again, I want to thank you, Holly Chunyang Bachman, for joining me on today's show. We would love to hear from you, our valued listeners, about any suggestions for future guests or topics. Don't forget to subscribe to our program on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on Facebook, X, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Asian Pacific Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers the Asian Pacific American communities with a voice through media arts. If you would like to support our program, please visit AsianPacificVoicesRadio.com. I'm Arnold Chun. Please join us again next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Pacific Voices Radio show. Until then, take care, everybody. <laughs>